Hello listeners, it's Adrian here from Mark Adazak, and on today's show I've got a huge guest, Eugene Jarvis, a real Atari legend. He's made Defender, Robotron, Smash TV, and now works in the arcade business with Raw Thrills. Guys, it's a really great interview, so sit back and enjoy a lovely talk with a true retro gaming legend. Welcome to Arcade Attack. A retro gaming podcast for up to four players. Hello listeners, welcome back to the latest Arcade Attack podcast. I've got another true retro gaming legend on the show today, a real pioneer he's he's seen it all it's eugene jarvis how you doing eugene hey i'm i'm doing good man i still have some eyesight left you know <laughs> <laughs> good on you it's um yeah look we, i know we've had you on our site before as a text interview but actually getting you on the proper show it's a real honor and you, you you've you've had a magnificent career so i can't wait to sort of pick your brains and uh, we'll start from the beginning if that's all right and again i'll sure. kind of looking around on your sort of wiki page and it might not be completely correct so you could always just you know correct me and stuff but i've got it here that you started work at hp you know, hewlett packard for only three days uh and then you you chose to leave is that true is there any truth in that yeah you know so um i don't know when you're when you're young uh you do some pretty stupid things you know <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, uh, you know, I was interviewing from, I graduated from college and I was interviewing and, uh, and I, I remember I interviewed at Atari and, uh, and I was really excited about that, you know, opportunity, you know, like working with games and, and then, uh, and then they never like called me back, you know, and I guess mm-hmm. like an idiot, I never thought of like calling them, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> I just, so I just thought, oh, well, you know, enough of that. And uh, ended up uh, going to work at HP. I was kind of excited about like computer compilers, language compilers, and language translators. I kind of, I kind of wanted to create a computer to pass the Turing test, you know. Mm. And, and so I thought, oh, I could learn a lot of stuff. Uh, and then the job was working with, uh, you know, computer language compilers. I guess the particular language was, I guess, one of the more heinous languages ever created called COBOL. Yeah. which is like some government programming language. And, uh, <laughs> you know, after about two or three days of that, um, you know, and I was, it's funny, I, I, at lunchtime, I'd, you know, we'd have lunch with the other engineers. Everybody kind of like brought their bag lunch in those days, you know, and you'd kind of like sit down at the lunch bit table and, uh, and they'd be all talking about how they were programming their lawn sprinklers and shit, you know? Right. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and that was like, you know, that was like, the state of the art for them, you know, and, uh, and I was just like, man, this is going to be a long, uh, actually it was going to be a six year project. Like, uh, this is going to be one long fucking six years. <laughs> and so, and so I just, I quit, I couldn't take it. And, uh, and just, just by, uh, blind luck, Atari, uh, called me a, a couple days later, you know, and they finally were getting back to me from like six months before. Ah, <laughs> and right. so then, so then I, then I went to work at Atari. Well, I didn't realize you had an interview before Hewlett Packard. Then, was that, yeah, yeah. So that was six months before, like a whole half a year. How... Yeah. Wow. Yeah, what... there was, I mean, it was chaotic. I mean, Atari was a very chaotic, uh, crazy place. I mean, it was like a bunch of hippies uh, trying to run a, uh, you know, a console, and and then they were getting into the pinball business, and mm. obviously they had the arcade video going, and they were getting into everything. I remember they, they even had a project to do video. Video telephones, if you can believe it. Video chat. Oh, wow. um, back in uh, that was the '76, and uh, so it was uh, a very interesting place, very uh, fast moving, and uh, um, people were, you know, coming and going. And uh, I, I mean, I, I remember I was in the programming department. Uh, a couple of I was doing for pinball games. They got they were getting into electronic pinballs, and mm. and uh, my boss quit, and like his boss quit, and. After a couple of weeks, I was like the department head, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> it, was, it was pretty ridiculous. Wow. Who interviewed you? Was it Nolan uh, Bushnell or was anyone else? Or? Um, Do you remember? You know, I, I think it was a really hot chick, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that, kind of like, 
that sealed the whole thing for me. And, uh, but, you know, no one would come down, you know, we'd see him, uh, and he'd be, uh, you know, just, it was funny. He had, he'd have, he had like a different take on it. He's a very creative guy, mm. very, um, you know, uh, sometimes just off the wall that we just come out, you know, like I remember we were working on sounds on the pinball game and he came down once and he was like, yeah, you know, we need to get like, you know, psych, psychiatric, uh, psychoacoustic, you know, human engineering, you know, human uh, input people find out what sounds are pleasurable and not, you know, we have to get all this research going and, you know, and, and, and a lot of times he'd make, he'd make suggestions that were just, you know, you realize like, this is never going to happen. <laughs> we have to, sh- we have to ship this thing in like two days, you know? Like, yeah. you know, and then you just kind of go, yeah, you know, I remember I, I was, I was just going like, yeah, you know, really good idea, Nolan. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll think about that, you know? And, uh, and then you, you know he'd go upstairs and, and like you know that would be it you know so yeah. then you'd get back to your real work <laughs> but it, but a great creative guy amazing creative guy yeah I mean you first started on pinball machines that's right isn't it before you moved into the, the games yeah that, right 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 so um had a chance to work with uh, Steve Ritchie who went who became a, a really you know big pinball designer over the years and uh, mm. so we had had some good you know, get some good times there. The, the Atari games, unfortunately had some technical issues and, uh, um, they, uh, you know, weren't, weren't too reliable. Sometimes they would, you know, kind of start smoking and, you know, I think the power supplies weren't well engineered. So. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what was the first pinball machine you worked on? Do you remember like properly got involved in, was it? Ah, uh, it was called the Atarians. Ah. You know, and, uh, you know, it was, uh, kind of a sci-fi theme and, uh, Actually, it was kind of fun. I got to work with uh, George Opperman, who was the like the artist at Atari, and uh, he he was a guy that designed the Atari logo, and wow. you know they had that whole kind of style, kind of this modernistic, uh, smooth kind of style for all their boxes. Remember that they all looked kind of the same, and mm. yeah, he was the guy behind that whole kind of Atari look uh, of that era, and uh, and a great great. Um, it did some great pinball glasses, uh, uh, you know, amazing, uh, mm. uh, you know, perspective and uh, amazing, amazing art, art uh, creator. Nice. Um, I mean, did you enjoy working on the pinball machines or were you always kind of sort of hankering to move on to the sort of more, uh, well, I don't think, is it adventurous or sort of more uh, like the video game side of things? Yeah, you know, it's funny because uh, in this era, I mean, I guess the, the big game was Breakout. Yes. And uh they really they hadn't really made the move to um microprocessors. They were just starting that move to actually put a microprocessor into a video game. They were all they were kind of in the last days of uh I guess what you call like hardware video games where mm. everything was, you know, hardwired logic and you'd have, you know, a counter, you know, a chip that would store your score and the chip would score my score mm-hmm. and you know, very, uh, you know, just a very um, chip by chip design um, done in, you know, hardwired logic and stuff. Mm. And, uh, and and those the games that you could do with that sort of uh, tech were, you know, fairly superficial Pong kind of games or you know, Breakout was maybe one of the more sophisticated ones. Um, and uh, so it was it was, uh, you know, I always thought of video games was like, yeah, they're kind of cool, but it wasn't really anything, you know, to me, like pinball was the shit you know mm, and, yeah. and uh and the complexity and the richness of a pinball game was just so much more than you know pong like uh video games oh fair enough um do you think there are any skills i mean they're they're, they're both gaming industries but you did you learn any sort of transferable skills from moving on pinball machines to actual video games oh yeah well you know obviously i learned uh a lot about programming yeah. uh, microprocessors and um it, it was funny it was such a a different world. I mean, it's hard to even imagine, but um, we actually didn't have uh, terminals and uh, we actually didn't even type. They, they just assumed like men couldn't type. So you would, you would write your code up on like, you know, a piece of graph paper or something, and then you'd submit it to the, the key punch girls. And yeah. then they would actually type your code into the computer and, and run it. And, uh, you know, then you get like your errors and stuff and, you know, you correct it, but you'd have, you basically were working through a typist because they, it was, you know, something like genetically men were incapable of typing or it was, you know, they were too good for it. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what it was, but it was, it was bizarre. 
Wow. And partly, I guess, partly, I guess we are all sharing the same computer development computer. So I guess maybe that was part of it too. <laughs> it's like, you really, <laughs> we just had one girl that could type really fast, you know, and she was like, you know, doing 10, 10 different programs, 10 different programmers were submitting jobs to her. But, um, that was, that was just kind of a bizarre, uh, dark age of things. And, uh, but, uh, you know, learned a lot about uh, games and programming, and especially audio, um, yeah. because you know, you know, kind of pinball was. There's a lot of dead time in a pinball game. You know, just the ball's kind of rolling around, and and it's very slow. And so, you had to figure out, you know, cool sounds and stuff to kind of fill the dead air, you know, mm. of the of the pinball game and, and the effects and everything. So I learned a hell of a lot about you know programming uh, digital synthesizers. And, and uh, how to make sounds and stuff. And, and that really was valuable in my later incarnation as a video game designer. Of course. And obviously, we're, we'll talk about Raw Thrills later, but uh, what do you think about maybe the slight death of uh, pinball machines? Or are you, is there any chance, you know, do you see it coming back at all ever? Or? Well, actually, you know, the, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's been a very cyclical industry. So mm. obviously, the absolute peak of pinball was probably in that era, probably at about 79, you know, mm. and uh, I think the industry was making, I think it was around uh, uh, half a million uh, pinball games a year. So it was like every day, 1,500 pinball machines were being built in, wow. in Chicago, typically. And uh, so that was pretty amazing. That was kind of the golden age of pinball was that late 70s where it still was, pinball was still a lot more entertaining than the early video games yeah and uh but of course you know when the the video boom really hit and the great uh you know classic games the pac-man defender asteroids Mm. um you know donkey kong all those great games um that just kind of the pinball industry went into a, a very steep decline and uh uh, but you know, it kind of came back when the the video, the arcade video crashed, and the pinball mm-hmm. kind of came back, and there was a kind of a boom back in the '90s where I think the industry was making you know maybe a hundred thousand games a year, you know, as opposed to five hundred thousand, and then then it kind of crashed again in uh, around 2000, and and then also 2009, and that and now it's actually come back, and I think the industry is. Uh, I'd say maybe a twenty thousand games a year are being made in the industry. <laughs> so it's like it's, it's not, yeah, it's still a number. Yeah. Yeah, and it's actually there's been a, 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 a quite a renaissance in the last uh, seven or eight years. Good. Um, of uh, and, and and a big thing about it is now they've incorporated video displays in the pinball game. So now they're, I think that's been a huge driver of uh, kind of a renewed excitement in pinball. And also there's just amazing uh, play field design, amazing uh, device work. Uh, I think. You know, a lot of this computer-aided design and stuff has really, um, really helped. Uh, you know, open a lot of doors for much more creative pinball machines. So, mm. you know, it's it's surprisingly pinball is is not dead. It's still uh, still alive and kicking, but you know, certainly it's... a shadow of its former self. Well, yeah. Say. But it's it's uh, it's got some very loyal following, and in the U.S., I know it's actually uh, increasing quite a bit. And uh, there's a worldwide uh, Players organization for pinball tournaments is called the IFPA uh, International Tournament, and I think that every year there's, I think there's around like ten or twenty thousand pinball tournaments taking place. So nice. It's uh, it's it's an interesting, very um, kind of uh, grassroots sort of uh, 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 you know incredible growth in uh, you know in the pinball players, and they're they're very. Uh, Kind of very, it's a very niche thing, but they're incredibly dedicated to their uh, art. That's really no good. I'm glad it's yeah. still around 100%. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right, Defender. Was that the first time you really got involved? Was that your first video game? Or exactly. You, was it? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that's kind of, you know, as a player, I loved, uh, you know, obviously I loved some of the games in the, in the late 70s. Um, I loved, uh, I, I think, Space War. Mm. To me, is maybe you know if I was saying what is the greatest video game ever, I would say Space War, um, you know, which which was actually um, developed in 1962, I think, or 63, early 60s, and you know, on computer mainframes at uh, MIT or at MIDI computers, I guess, the early MIDI computers, and uh, 
Uh, but I think that that game is just amazing. And I, I love that, you know, it's kind of a, a two player death match, you know, uh, mm. it has gravity. It has, you know, planets, explosions. And, you know, it was a very interesting game for um, I mean, this thing was, you know, 10 years before Pong. Um, that I think was is a great game, um, and I love playing Asteroids and uh, Space Invaders. Of course, was probably you know the game that really got me wanting to uh, design my own game. It just the the feeling of that that tension, the the uh, incredible rush you had if you could finish off a wave of invaders, and you know just the the the, the soundtrack. I think was just. I don't know if people, I, I, I'm sure people died of a heart attack listening to that thing. <laughs> and I was, you know, I'd be like, it's like so incredible. Uh, so that was just a great, great game. I think the game that really opened up the industry as far as what could be done with a, a real computerized uh, video game. Were you given like free reign to do whatever you wanted? Um, Eugene, were you like you told me any game you want? Were you given like make a space game? How much sort of control do you have for it? So, um, yeah, no, I had pretty much I could do whatever the hell I wanted to, which was <laughs> uh, so. Anyway, basically, we uh, Steve Ritchie and myself had left Atari and we went to Chicago uh, to do more pinball games, and then it was at Chicago at, at Williams that um, you know I got the opportunity, and they knew nothing about video games, so they just said, well, you know. I, I think I might have proposed like, hey, let's do a video game. They go, oh, sure, what the hell, you know? <laughs> I'm like, go for it, man. Love it. I mean, how do you ref- reflect on the success of the game? It's uh, is a huge seller. You know, when you're like the only guy, and even if you don't know shit about it, you know, it's like it's it's like you, it's like you you're they just throw you in the friggin' uh, ocean and like you know swim, dude, you know, <laughs> and uh, and wow. so that was. Uh, um, that was the uh, that was that was the crazy thing. So it was me and I, you know, we had a, uh, some hardware guys and mm. uh, um, I was a, a, another uh, programmer. Uh, I hired, I think the guy was uh, Sam Dicker. He was the kid was like you know I don't know seventeen or eighteen or something. I don't even know if he graduated high school. <laughs> I, I remember it was like it was like well you know we're probably gonna need another programmer on this project you know and like this guy walks in and like you know. Hey man, do you know how to program a computer? And he goes, "Yeah." Like, okay, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> you, you couldn't make it up. <laughs> and so it was just, just you know, just crazy uh, seat of the pants type of stuff that you know today would be, you know, maybe you'd be talking about why, of course, everything would have failed. You know, <laughs> you know that would be the the post mortem of the complete failure of the Defender project. You know, we could, I mean, we could be talking about all the, you know, the idiotic things we did, but was that some, was that almost the success and failure of Atari summed up though? How much freedom you had and how little direction you had in a weird way. I, I think so. You know, it, there was really um, obviously you have to have the right people in the right time, and mm. and but it was a very pioneering time and. I mean, I was a vi- I was a big player of video games at the time, and you know, so I just had that passion. I w- I was my own audience, you know, and I was like, yeah, what I want to do, you know, like, okay, Space Invaders is cool, but you know, you're stuck on this screen, and you can only move, you know, sideways, and you know, and I, I want to like, you know, f- fly all over the screen. I want to fly. I want to have multiple screens. I want to, you know, have this world out there. You know, it's like you you have this this these visions that you know you get so tired of playing the limitations of of uh, the games of a, a certain era and then you want to break through those barriers and you know and try new things and uh um you know luckily i i had some technical expertise and you know and i had some great uh uh great team working with me on the game and uh and somehow you know there's a lot of false starts on the on the project mm. i mean it was I, I did i started out just making like really bad versions of space invaders i remember the the first thing a defender was going to be it was uh and i i'd love space invaders so much i'd say well let's do space invaders but you have you can shoot in three directions you know instead oh, wow. of one <laughs> you know and so you had like three buttons you know left like left 45 right 45 and straight up you know play that for you know you know, it took me like two days to get it running and played it for for about 30 seconds. Like, okay, wow. this sucks. <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> All right, 
next game. <laughs> and uh, so it was, it was kind of like, uh, uh, I mean, I had like the name, you know, I just, I liked the idea of defending and I, you know, I felt, you know, it was a great, you know, if you're going to blow the shit out of everything, you want to want to have some moral uh, ground to stand on. <laughs> so yeah. you're, you're, you're defending, you know, so, um, and, and uh, you know, so I had the kind of the, that feeling of, and, you know, this, you're calling the game Defender. And and so it, that was really all I had, you know, and it was like, how do I, what, what, where do we go from here? Amazing. I mean, what you, really quickly, what do you think of Defender 2000, the Jeff Minter kind of uh, tribute to your game? You played it? Um, yeah, no, that is, no, it's, it's, it's awesome, man. It's, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, Jeff is always uh, crazy creative guy and he kind of marches to his own drummer and everything yep. you know and and uh that was uh you know i, I thought it was it was really incredible probably uh, you know might have been a little tough for me <laughs> but uh, <laughs> i'm not very good at it <laughs> i don't know if it's you know you know if, if the uh my re- reflexes may be quite what they are but uh it, the uh but i thought it was a great take on it and uh um so i think that was cool but you know it's like i don't know to me you know and i did stargate which was another sequel to defender mm. and and had them you know a million things in it too and but i don't know for like these days it's like i just want to play the good old defender you know it's yeah it's kind of like you know pac-man you know where it's like they've done a million sequels and this that yeah. of pac-man but for some reason you at the end of the day you want to go back to the uh the original like a like a like a music cut you know like uh you know you hear the original version of uh you know uh you know the uh same uh, let it be you know by the beatles or something oh, you course, know and, yeah. and then you know and, and and you can hear all kinds of versions and and uh but then like oh you know what i really uh you know i really liked uh the way they did you know i want to hold your hand you know or something <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's like, it's kind of like, it's about the time. It's about who you were. It was about, there's all these things associated. And I think games are a lot like music in that aspect where it's, you have these memories and, um, of the time and the, and the place and, and it all gets wrapped together, you know, um, and maybe just an incredible time in your life. Uh, and then, uh, sometimes it can be disappointing because like, you go back, you know, 20 30 years later and play that game again and like and you're just going oh my god this thing is terrible <laughs> that's like how did i you know how could i have thought that was cool yeah you know, it's like <laughs> we've all been there <laughs> <laughs> oh eugene that's no, brilliant I'm, yeah. i've got to ask actually why did you leave atari because obviously you built up a a big name already you built one of the best selling games of their you know, sort of time at atari but why did you end up leaving and start in um, i think it's called vid kids is that right Right, no, but I I did Defender. It was, it was at Williams I did Defender. Not oh, sorry, Defender. my apologies. Yeah. Of course, you yeah, did. no problem. Yeah. So anyway, so um, uh, yeah, you know, it was uh, I just felt you know, it's funny. Like they, the management, we had you know just incredible success with Defender and the 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 factory. That's all they built for like an entire year was mm. Defender. You know? mm. <laughs> and, and I think they built like you know seventy thousand or something of them, and uh, and it was uh, and then they started you know, they just started like they going well you know if we hire one you know one you know hippie with a typewriter and we got Defender let's hire you know fifty hippies with typewriters mm. and we'll and we'll get uh, you know we'll have fifty great games you know and uh, and it, it became kind of uh, like this huge you know kind of uh, bullpen of like you know trying to turn this into a, like a game factory and that I, I i was more like the artisanal you know type guy you know or i just wanted to be in a small place with a few people and just do something cool you know and uh nice uh and so that that's so i you know i didn't really fit in with the with the kind of the big company that they they became and uh and so me and uh a buddy of mine uh larry damar um who was who was a uh, one of the great pinball coders of that era. Um, we we decided to go out and you know do our own thing. Good. And was it Stargate the next game? Is that right? I forgot. Exactly. So yeah. um, we uh, so we you know it was I think it was a is a, um, it's funny like Defender got it was it was a grind to get that thing going and uh, so I think you know after I finally got it going uh, the crazy thing was 
I remember the um, the last thing I ever did was I decided to uh, bring after five waves I would give you a new set of men, you know, mm. and I, I was like I, I realized like you know. No, I, I don't think anyone will ever make it to wave five because it's so difficult. But if they ever did, I'll put the <laughs> I'll put the I'll put the uh, men back at every every fifth wave, you know, just just on the outside chance that, you know, someone that might ever get that good, you know, and uh, and that turned out to be like, you know, probably made the game, you know, uh, you know, the game it was, you know, just that little afterthought, you know, um, it's amazing some of the little tweaks you make in a game later on turn out to be like pivotal features mm. and uh but anyway so um after finishing defender um just kind of like took a vacation for a few months i don't even think i told anybody where i was <laughs> 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 and, and so you know finally came back and um you know hang out with my buddy larry and and we decided you know we just said ah fuck this you know and uh, I think we actually tried doing some 3D games and stuff, oh, some wow. early some early prototypes, and that didn't didn't pan out too well. So I was like, ah, fuck that. And mm. so we decided to, you know, go go start our own thing. And uh, and I guess you know this kind of upset the management at Williams there, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so so they called us up, and and they were actually had this office in New York City, which was very bizarre. We're like the absolute, you know, the chairman of the board and. You know, they had, you know, there's some really swank office in, uh, I think it was uh, Park Avenue or something. And uh, um, so they flew us out there and, uh, you know, and uh, went around in this, this limo. They took us, we got this limo from the airport wow. and we um, ended up taking it to Times Square, which was like just a bunch of porno theaters and, and like <laughs> drug addicts and stuff. But they had the greatest arcade in town there. <laughs> so we... We we spent the first few hours, you know, playing games at the arcade. <laughs> I think we were we were late to the meeting, but we finally finally got the meeting. And and they uh, they go, you know, we're you know we need a game in like three months, man. It's <laughs> like you know, because uh, you know, Defender will eventually end, and we have yeah. nothing else. <laughs> and so and so we we had three months to make the the sequel to Defender, and. Uh, so it was it was uh, so Larry and I just said okay what the hell so basically they were kind of just paying us more money to do what we did before and kind of we were just kind of independent too at the same time so that that was kind of a win win for everybody That's so that brilliant. was kind of the, that was a bit good so the uh, so we you know it was when you make a game you always have you know you have to at some point you just have to ship the code you know and uh, mm. and uh, it's funny this programmer friend of mine from the Stone Age has always said you know. It, Software is never finished. It just at some point it becomes useful, you know. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think that is so true about you know anybody you know anywhere you know as they encounter all the very, very uh, annoying bugs and commercial software, you know, realizes that yeah at some point it became useful, but it's certainly not finished, you know. So uh, when you're doing like when like when we did the fit, a lot of compromises were made, and so it was kind of a chance for us to go back and. Like, hey, let's let's optimize all these routines. We can we can you know get more frame rate and have you know twice of the objects on the screen and you know three times the bullets and you know we kind of <laughs> didn't realize that maybe the human being at some point couldn't deal with this shit. But um, but so we had really had a chance to you know kind of do the Stargate, which was you know kind of fix everything we wanted to fix in Defender and put in a lot of cool new stuff and. And it, and it really uh, a lot of people, um, a lot of players, you know, actually are Stargate players, and they love it more than Defender. And there's mm. those purists that love Defender more than Stargate. I know it's not linked, but what's your views on the Stargate movie that came out <laughs> a few years later? Um, yeah, well, that, I guess that was just a totally different thing, though, right? <laughs> yeah, of course it was. <laughs> but they stole your name. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of a sci-fi. Uh... I remember yeah. watching. It was it was kind of interesting. Pretty bizarre. Yeah. Robotron. I mean, what a classic. Robotron 2084, to be exact. Um, I mean, was 1984 an inspiration for that game? That's what I've I've got down here. Is that is that right? Well, totally. Yeah. Um, because uh, I, mean, I was just. It's weird. Like sometimes I get really philosophical, and you know, like you could see like computers are getting smarter and smarter and smarter, even in in those days, which were pretty. Mm-hmm 
pretty primitive, but you can see like memories are doubling and doubling and doubling. I remember the first game, uh, first pinball game where our soundboard had 512 bytes of memory. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and we had like, I put like 30 sounds in that. It was pretty amazing. Anyway, the, the, <laughs> And then, like, by the time Defender came along, we had two kilobytes in the sound mm. program. And uh, and so, you know, the ship was doubling. And you could just see, you know, like, double, 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 double. I mean, at some point, as stupid as they were, after enough doublings, it's going to be smarter than people, you know? Mm. I mean, it's just, it's mathematics, you know? Um, and uh, so, you know, just processing that that thought pattern you know, um, you realize like, hey, this is for real. I mean, there'd been a lot of sci-fi about the robots and everything, but here was like, mm. this is now mathematics. This is going to happen. They're going to get smarter than us. And, you know, and then you, you start thinking about that premise and then you start thinking about, you know, well, what, what, what is, how is it going to go down? You know, and it's mm. like, well, you know, we'll obviously start using robots or AI, or whatever the hell it is, you know, for more and more things become more and more dependent upon them at some point you know they just realize humans are kind of nasty you know messy people and you know they're <laughs> building nuclear weapons and you know they're kind of dangerous you know mm. if you get right down to it <laughs> and and it's you know it's like it's almost like you know maybe we need to you know prevent to prevent the world from being destroyed by their you know whether it's nuclear or you know, global warming or whatever apocalypse is next, mm. um, you you really have to, uh, you know, change the, uh, you know, change the team, you know, and, <laughs> and you know, <laughs> you know, retire the humans and bring on the, uh, the robots. And, you know, and obviously they're much more efficient. They could probably run on, you know, a tenth of the energy and, you know, it, it just, uh, it, you just realize like these, these human beings are very inefficient. Like you think about it for space exploration, I mean, how pathetic, you know, you have yeah. to, you have to send these guys around and they weigh like, you know, 300 pounds and they're, and they're, you know, they eat and they need air and, you know, all this shit and they fart, you know, and like, <laughs> it's, you know, this is ridiculous. Yeah. You know, just get a, get a freaking chip, you know, and stick it in orbit, you know, like, we don't need all that crap. So, um, you know, it, it uh, you know, and then, and then you, you know, you just you get kind of dystopian on these things and, uh, so the uh, that was kind of the premise that you know the robots you know the human you know we have that little tagline the human you know race is inefficient and therefore must be destroyed yes you know and that's kind of the the essence of it it's like is it efficient you know like how efficient is your electric car you know um, that's the final you know at the end of the day we're just judged on our efficiency you know and uh, the processing power you know or how many watts per you know unit of uh computing efficiency so um so you know that was kind of the the basic you know premise of the whole game and uh and uh you know it was like how well, how do you uh and it was like well how can you make people care about this i mean it's kind of impersonal it's kind of you know abstract you know like okay the computer's going to take a you know who gives a shit I, you know i just want to i just i'm just looking for my next bear you know um <laughs> And uh, so it was, you know, trying to bringing in like the, your family in there, you know, and, uh, um, you know, kind of make you care about something, you know, kind of the same thing as the, in Defender where you had the the astronauts, you know, where there's there's something you just don't want to have a kill fest with nothing to care about. You know, yeah. you want to have something that you're saving, something you're um, and, and, it's, and it's interesting, like you you'll do something more like you'll do more for somebody else than you'll do for your own self often, you know, mm. um, you know, you'll risk your life to save someone else where, you know, you wouldn't maybe do the same thing for yourself sometimes. So mm. it's a very powerful psychology of, of helping others and, and, uh, saving others. And, uh, so you just, you know, kind of making, you know, you have obviously the survival thing, you know, all these things trying to create an emotional experience, that is very engaging to the player and then and then on the kind of the play mechanic front um it's kind of a you know it's kind of a space invaders but it's a space invaders that's space invaders is almost like one dimensional you know the stuff is coming down on you yeah. um you move in a line they move in a line you know it's it's, it's a one dimensional game it's like what what would be how do we bring that into two dimensions you know and then it was like okay well you 
instead of being at the bottom, you put the guy in the middle and the shit comes from all sides simultaneously, you know? And it's like, it's like, holy shit. You know, I was sitting like, that's fucking scary. You know, it's like, I mean, that's, that's going to get your attention, you know? Like, and if you're, you know, if you're not, if you're, you're going to die in like, you know, three milliseconds if you don't yeah. know what the fuck you're doing. You know, it's like, and so it was just like, how to, it's like the ultimate pressure cooker, you know, like, and, and, and it's kind of like in, in that era, some of the, the kind of the hardcore games of that era was just like, how do we, you know, give the guy a heart attack? You know, how do we get like the most adrenaline, the most tension, you know, just over, over stimulate, overdrive, yeah. you know, you know, the brain to the point of it, it freaking explodes, you know, and that, that was the, the idea of like the kind of the play mechanic of Robotron was, um, you know, you're in the middle, everything's coming at you, you know, just yeah. deal, deal with it, man. You know, and you got, you got, you know, deal with it. And you have like two seconds to make a decision or, you know, two milliseconds. And, uh, yeah. and, and, it, and it just, and then, and then obviously you need, uh, a super powerful, um, if you're going to have that kind of shit coming at you, you have to have a super powerful weapon. Mm. And, and that's where the, you know, the dual joystick came in. And, the, and it was kind of my frustrations with playing the game berserk, which I love that, you know, kind of robot game. And, uh, and so that was the dual joystick was kind of my, uh, thing of like, what, what how would I make berserker get a game? Well, you know, I, I didn't like, you know, having to walk toward things you're trying to kill, and where you know with a dual joystick you can be walking away and killing them and you know walking in different directions and killing in different directions and you know it's much more efficient you yeah. know if uh, if you're getting destroyed for being inefficient you better get start getting efficient so <laughs> no it's brilliant it's, yeah I, I agree i i want to ask actually was was this the first arcade machine to use dual stick controllers i don't know if you know um it. as a dual joystick obviously there yeah. was uh there was, you know, Pac-Man, of course, was a joystick. and, and uh, Yeah, jewel so, one, yeah. But, you know, it's amazing. actually, it's funny. When I was designing Defender, um, we ended up using a two-way joystick for the up and down. And I, I originally, I wanted to have a full joystick, but at that summer, somehow they, I couldn't find a supplier for it. But hmm. um, as far as I know, it was the first one that uses a joystick, independent joysticks for moving and firing. Amazing. Yeah, that's absolutely incredible. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I've got it here. Well, it's it, the Robotron uh, game, the enemies, are, are quite complex AI, actually. Um, how how did that go about? How did you try and... Because that, that's what made the game stand out as well, I think. What what what, what, what was your ideas behind making the uh, the enemies like quite intelligent, really? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's funny, you know, we, we they, they were somewhat intelligent. And uh, the amazing thing is, like, their program, their brain is like... The program, I think, is like you know, fifty or sixty bytes. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's like, and they and they do some really interesting shit. Um, but uh, a lot of that was stuff I learned on Defender, and just it was just how to fuck with the player, you yeah. know, and how to basically psychologically just destroy you. And uh, so, like the um, projectiles in the game. Um, you know, there's different ways you can. You know, so an enemy is firing a projectile at you. Um, they, you could fire it right where the player is. I mean, that's the simplest thing. Just fire it at the player. Um, and that's kind of interesting. But mm-hmm. if you're moving, if you're on the move, then that becomes, uh, you know, maybe not so effective. And it's very predictable. Mm-hmm. And so then it was like, well, okay, let's have another different sh- shot. That's what I would call a a rel, like a rel bomb or something, a rel shot, where it's relative to the player. So it's... Basically, you take the player's velocity and you add that to um, the uh, direction. You know, shoot. Uh, basically, you shoot at shoot at him, but add his velocity to the velocity of the projectile. So, basically, it's going to where you will be in like a second. <laughs> you know, and uh, and that really fucks you up. Yeah. And then uh, then uh, then there was an- another shot where. Um, we had uh, the enforcers, for instance, or shoot these kind of little spark balls at you. And their their thing was like, well, let's add a random curve to the whole thing, you know. So so basically, a random acceleration is added to the thing. So it's like it's now it's like a curveball, you know. And it's like it can like spin toward you, and and uh, you know, it, it, that, and that just like you know is ridiculous. 
and uh, and then then you're mixing them up like the uh, you know different enemies use different algorithms and even uh, you know the same enemy might might be able to send you know two or three different types of shots at you. Mm-hmm. And so it really, and then you add obviously a little random, uh, a random, uh, say, uh, like a uh, direct, little randomness to the direction. So it kind of like goes, sometimes it's right at you, sometimes it's, you know, a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. And so even if you're dodging it or whatever, sometimes you walk right into it, dodging it because the thing was shot, you know, two inches to the left of you in the beginning, you know? Yeah. And or it's in curving into you know so it's it's all these little very subtle things you know it's it's and it's very basic mathematics um, but because you make all these things different and you have it's almost like a stew you know like a really nice soup is what I th- kind of thought you know the the game originally was just the grunts you know which are the guys that just come at you the yeah. the base robots and they just all they do is just seek you I mean it's completely blind except they you know have an accelerating uh, velocity um that gets faster and faster um and that's just basic but it's kind of like the you know that's like the basic you know um vanilla cake you know and yeah. then and then you go well that's that's okay but i'm getting tired of eating vanilla cake all the time okay well let's bring in you know uh say another enemy like, like the enforcers which is the uh, the second enemy and and those, it's kind of interesting, a, a spawning, uh, through a spawning effect where you have these, uh, these spheroid circles and they, and they, you know, really, they kind of go out and then they lay eggs for the, <laughs> the enforcers <laughs> and then they grow up and come after you. And so, and if you don't get, you know, you have to, you want to kill the thing that's spawning first because then it, otherwise it keeps making more of them, you know? Yeah. And, and so you have this kind of the spawning effect and that adds further chaos to it. And uh, so, you know, and then and they kind of glide around. They move differently. They don't always seek you. They're kind of moving maybe in more of an offset of you and gliding around. And, you know, then you throw in, uh, you know, so that's two enemies. You know, you have the spark ball, which is their shooting. I guess we have the, the electrodes that you just walk into and die. Um, you know, and then like, okay, let's have an enemy. This is kind of uh, the Hulk, which was indestructible. Mm. And, uh, like you can't even kill him. You can kind of push him away a little bit. So you, you get a little bit of feedback, you know, you're kind of like, he's coming to crush you and you're kind of like <laughs> holding him off. Like, you know, you're just like hoping like, how, you know, like I need to get out of here quick, but like, there's nowhere to move. And he's coming right at me. I'm like, ah, you know, the, and I think that's one of the beauties of the game is that, that sense of confinement, mm. you know, where you're stuck as, as opposed to like defender where you, you have this huge universe, you're flying around and everything's cool. <laughs> Robotron, you are stuck on this screen, and you're and you're just like surrounded. You're, you're always shits coming from all sides, and you're, it's confinement, and it's like it's trapped. You're trapped, and you're trying to find a way out. You know, just and there's there's like you know you know it's uh, flight or um, yeah, fight or flight, fight or flight, fight yeah. or flight. You know, there's all these you know things. So that so then you know the Hulk is interesting. You know, just it fucks you up. Compl- it's like a moving wall, blocks your shots and comes to crush you and, and they kind of walk semi-randomly but i think they're kind of maybe a little bit relative you to you and um you know so you have those guys and you throw in the um the brains you know which uh you know then you know um come in the and the only in the brain waves and uh, they have their cruise missiles and stuff and mm. um which is kind of like a random you know kind of a random walk of a projectile that uh, is still kind of seeking you sort of you know yeah <laughs> and and just like a ter- you know it goes almost as fast as you're going you know so you could you could kind of you know it's amazing just the tweaking of the the velocities when you're playing the game you know you just tweak things so you can almost outrun them but maybe not you know just get, you know you give the guy hope and then you crush him you know and like yeah yeah it, it's just like but it's all in tweaking the the velocities how fast you move how fast the enemies are moving how how fast the projectiles are um you know and uh all using kind of different algorithms uh you know, the, uh, of course the brains are attacking your human family and reprogramming them. And so you have another goal, obviously to rescue your human family, but there are to prevent the brains from reprogramming them into progs. Mm. And so you end up with all these, you know, goals, you, 
conflicting goals. I want to stay alive. I want to kill this thing. I want to rescue this person. I want to do that. I got to kill the spheroid. Got to, you know, before it responds more, I've got to, you know, it's like, it's, it's, uh, it's just this complete chaotic, um, you know, many, many, you might have 10 or 15 goals that are operating in your brain at the same time. And, 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 and while you're dodging shots and, you know, um, so it's just, it's just a complete mental overload and, uh, uh, and just that mix of all these things brewed together. And, uh, the, you know, the last enemy was the tank, which, um, was thrown in. It was actually my, my buddy, uh, Larry DeMar, his idea. And, uh, um, and then, then the whole idea of that enemy was it, uh, it was kind of like, a, it had like computer tapes in it. If you wa- looked at the graphics, very mm-hmm. crude, but it had like a tape drive in it. <laughs> it was like <laughs> some kind of like fifties and fifties computers. Anyway, the, um, uh, but the cool thing, you know, I shot these, these balls and they, and like, unlike any other projectile in the game, it would actually reflect off the, the boundary walls nice. and, uh, and it just, and just that, just the, you know, kind of like pool, you know, and, uh, billiards and, and it's like, and you're like, uh, you know, and, and it just totally destroys your, uh, you know, your, your mind, your, your mind and your game, because you haven't seen anything like that, you know, up until like wave seven where it shows up and, and, and it's like your whole game has to change based on, on these bouncing things coming off, reflecting off the walls, as opposed to, most of the other projectiles just kind of slide down a wall and these things reflect back at you. So all of a sudden it's, it's a, uh, it's a very dangerous world out there. Love it. Robert. What a classic. Um, Smash TV is obviously, you know, it's similar in a way, isn't it? It's quite a similar looking game, but pushed on a little bit further. We love it on Arcade Attack, by the way, we're a massive fan of Smash TV. Um, was the game inspired by the running man? I have to ask. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that was, uh, it was a couple of, you know, there's a, a number of, uh, movies in the eighties there that were, yeah. I guess great classics, you know, like Terminator, obviously oh, yeah. running man was, was a huge influence. And also the, uh, um, the, um, Robocop, oh, you brilliant. know, and some of the, like some of the, the TV ads. And stuff, you know, was, yep. uh, um, that inspiration. And so, um but you know the whole thing you know just you know you're in the future world and you're you know killing people for toasters you know and it's brilliant <laughs> <laughs> oh it's so good it's am- it was um was running man your favorite arnie film have you got what have you got a particular favorite eugene that you you love um uh, of my games no uh, of, of, of your arnold schwarzenegger films oh that's schwarzenegger um I guess I would say the, you know, the original, I, I guess my favorite of them all would be uh, the original Terminator and, and then T2, I think yes. might've been, um, that might've been his peak, you know, uh, yeah. um, where uh, I, I remember the, I think, I'm not sure if it was the original Terminator or T2. Maybe, uh, I guess, I guess I remember the, actually the original Terminator where he, um, He's in the gun shop or something. Oh, that's brilliant. And and this and the guy, you know, and he goes, I would like a forty watt plasma <laughs> rifle, you know. <laughs> and the guy, and the guy, uh, you know, whatever. The guy goes, Oh, okay, here it is, you know. <laughs> they start, yeah. you know, pointing it at the guy and shit. And the <laughs> and the and the clerk says, uh, you know, like, uh, you can't do that, you know. Like, right. <laughs> you know, and then, and then you see his like, you see his computer screen, and he's like picking out what to say. Yeah, you know, there's like fuck you asshole or something. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> I love you know just that that early AI. You know, yeah. thing. but I, I, to me that was the original Terminator, and then T2 also was was a great great. Uh, movie. It's amazing. No, it's, yeah, yeah. Um, back to Smash TV. What a, it's a, yeah. such a great game. It's um what obviously robotron well correct me if I'm wrong but it sounds like that was kind of the next step was there any other things like game mechanics that you were thinking about bringing into the game but never made it or any other, any crazy ideas when you're thinking of smash tv oh uh, smash tv you know we really i mean again it was kind of like the uh, stargate to robotron you know mm. and uh so we were like uh i was working with uh, mark tamel who was a huge huge fan of robotron and he ended up uh doing uh the huge hit uh, nba jam mm. um which was just a massive massive game but 
Um, great, amazing talent. Uh, he's still active together. I think he's working at uh, Zynga doing interesting things. But uh, um, the uh, you know, so we were just kind of like both huge fans of Robotron and and you know, like wow, what could we do? And you know, and the, the, originally in Robotron, I, I really the original game was. Um, I wanted to have all these different rooms and, you know, going underground and do all these, you know, all these different themed areas and things. And, and, uh, you know, it just, it turned out, you know, that it was fun, you know, and a lot less work not to have room, you know, the game was fun <laughs> enough. And it was like, Oh, fuck rooms, man. Who cares? It was like, this thing is fun, you know? Uh, but for the sequel, it's like, well, let's have the rooms, you know, so mm. we, we, we you know, have all these themed rooms and stuff. And, uh, Although they're they're all kind of square and look pretty similar, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there was kind of a map, you know, and, mm. and kind of this meta game, and uh, so that was one of the things we wanted to do. Um, you know, we 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 wanted to do the boss monster thing, you know, because that was kind of a big thing uh, starting in the in the late eighties there. Uh, mm. You know, having bosses and you know that was a big deal, and uh, a part of it was uh, the gameplay style. You know, in the early 80s, it was like, I want to play forever. You know, if I'm great enough, I want to play forever. I want to, mm. you know, go, I want to play for three days, you know, and, <laughs> and put in one coin, you know, it's like <laughs> player's fantasy, you know. And uh, unfortunately, like, like the game operators was like, well, fuck that, man. It's mm. like, we got to get people <laughs> paying, you know, like, you know, and so the the concept of this buy-in game. Where you had to keep pay, you know, you you would no matter what you did, like the boss monster would kill you and you have to pay more money. You know, <laughs> it's kind of like you know a paywall, you know, in in today's uh, mobile like free to play yeah, games, you know, where yeah. you, you know like you wave, you know, thirty eight and Candy Crush, you will fucking die, you know, <laughs> and we're gonna get some money out of you. And uh, and so we, you know, we had to do you know had the same economic issues, and uh, so there was a lot of. Uh, you know, the, and, and it was it was fun, uh, and we had so much fun creating a you know, mutoid man, and you know all the different boss monsters, and you know ending up with the the MC himself was like the final boss, and um, so that was it was a lot of fun, you know, just adding that in and and kind of creating the uh, the buy-in mechanic, and then having all the pickups, you know, in the original Robotron there were no power-ups, mm. so you know, kind of bringing the power-up thing in, and having super weapons, and you know, and, uh, you know, all kinds of interesting stuff, which, you know, were very handy against the boss monsters and, uh, um, you know, and, and kind of and having two players simultaneous, of course, which was huge, you know, mm. um, and it's so much more fun to have you and your buddy, you know, oh, it's like, yeah. I would love to go back in Robotron and maybe have two guys, you know, have a version with two people, you know, or have maybe have 10 people, you know, <laughs> it's like have 10 players, you know, playing wow. Robotron on a, on like, can you imagine, you know, get like about a, like a, you know, a 70 inch screen or something and, you know, have, have, you know, a few thousand robots, oh, you know, wow. <laughs> just sitting on you that, and you're playing with like five or 10 people. I would play that. <laughs> um, but, uh, so, you know, it was cool to have the two players and, and, and that was, you know, obviously it was fun, but it also was again, kind of economics where, you know, if you can milk two people for money at the same time, then, you know, all the merrier, you know, so, <laughs> so, you know, more efficient, you know? You gotta efficiently monetize. I like it. You know? um, so, uh, so that was, uh, you know, but it, it was kind of fun back in that era um, where we were really trying to monetize the shit out of things, and uh, you know, a lot of those same principles ended up uh, like 20, 30 years later in the in the mobile games. Um, and uh, it's kind of interesting. Even in uh, there were actually some some arcade games that actually had. Um, you could buy upgrades to like vehicles and I remember the game Cyberball, which is a American football game. You, you actually could pay extra money to get a, a better quarterback and shit. Wow. <laughs> and this, this was, you know, and stuff that, you know, the early microtransactions, which, you know, then became, uh, you know, hundred billion dollar industry oh, and, uh, and today's mobile environment. It's insane. Um, um, yeah. We we spoke off there slightly before we uh, start started an interview, uh, Eugene, about John Tobias. We've had him on the show before, a proper proper legend, as uh, as you know, you know well. And he spoke very highly about you, like you you were his sort of mentor at the time. You obviously he went on to make Mortal Kombat, but you said earlier he worked on Smash TV. Is that right? And can you give a little background? 
Yeah, so that was his. Uh, I think we had just hired him. You know, it was like we were uh, Tamel and Tamel and I were staffing up the team, and uh, you know, we uh, interviewing people, and uh, and John was, I think, maybe one of the first guys we talked to, and as an artist, and he uh, he came actually from the comic book world, and he was a comic artist originally, and uh, um, and we just you know saw his sketches and his, his creativity and everything, and we just wow, man, we need to get this guy on the on the team, and. Uh, um, you know, it, it was, he was really, you know, the, the heart and soul of all those incredible boss monsters, mutoid mm. man, um, the, even the, uh, you know, down to just the player characters, uh, it was, it was interesting. A lot of it was just 3d out of his mind, but I remember to get the, um, the original player ca- characters and the, and the low level grunts that like had the baseball bats and kind of beat the shit out of you. <laughs> um, <laughs> We uh, we actually it was crazy. We we wanted to set up. We wanted to get it more. You know, Robotron was such a, you know a classic, but it was this flat, you know, mm. um, weird, you know, I don't know, pancake projection, you know. And uh, so we wanted to bring it into like a two and a half D situation where you know just much more realistic and and uh, I mean actually very contemporary look. And uh, um. And then, the, and the, and to get the perspective right, we initially actually had people. We had guys up on step ladders, um, filming uh, characters and uh, you know, and costume and stuff, and and you know, like the guys with the baseball bats and stuff. And and so we were able to key in a lot of the animations for the uh, the humans um, using real human models and uh, you know, digi- digitizing. Uh, uh, computer la- computer digitizing uh, color photo color uh, video and uh you know obviously john uh you know had to completely you know clean up everything and kind of make it in in his style and uh um but the uh for the non-human characters that was all from the uh the mind of john and his his an incredible imagination and uh it was kind of cool the uh with the boss monsters we kind of developed a we just kind of we kind of got tired of the the classic boss monster where you you sit there and you just like you have to shoot him four thousand times and then he like explodes or something. <laughs> it's like you know, and you have maybe, maybe there's a count on the screen. And you're like, oh, you're at three thousand eight hundred seventy four. You know, <laughs> and you know, just kind of boring. You know, and like um, so we wanted to have like something really fun for the player so he has constant feedback of how he's damaging the boss and. And uh, and, how, and we wanted to have like different levels of the boss, um, kind of like you know the nested uh, Russian dolls kind of thing, and uh, and so you would you know you'd break through you know the you know mutate to blow him up you know once and then then you know then he's like in his underwear and you shoot him again and he's, you, know, just, <laughs> like, you know just like different uh, levels of uh, of uh, and it just in different weapons would come into play you know the boss monster would change his uh, weapon characteristics, his physical characteristics and uh, showing his damage and his, his injuries and stuff and um, made it just really, you know, he really felt uh, very, very realistic feeling for the boss battles, you know? And, and so John had to do all that stuff, all the different injury levels and mm. all the, you know, different, uh, le- the different characters that were kind of nested within the, the boss monster, uh, um, all of it made pixel by pixel. There was no, we had Incredible. no art tools really. We just had uh, a pixel drawing machine, and then so he would uh, pixel by pixel. He did, um, you know, an, an incredible uh, cast of characters and just beautiful style. Everything kind of, you know, holds to that style and and looks really cool. The whole game kind of holds together, mm-hmm. and, and uh, you know, that whole kind of photo studio. Uh, you know, running man kind of thing. And, uh, so it was, it was just a really pleasure. Just this kid, you know, I don't know, 19 year old kid, uh, comic book artist. And he, uh, really found his true, uh, forte was as a, a video game, uh, creator. Well, good on you for giving him a chance, you know, you know, it sounds like, you know, he didn't have much experience, but he took a punt and it works out. So well done. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was funny. We had another weird story. We had a, we were hiring this programmers and, uh, we hired this one kid, um, I think his name was Rob and, uh, and, uh, you know, he, he was, you know, working on the program for a month or two and like, you know, this guy's not making any progress, you know? And, <laughs> and then, so Tamel's, I guess Tamel's, you know, working with them and, 
finally he realized the guy could not see. Oh. <laughs> and, and so he, he took him down to an eye doctor and got him glasses. And, <laughs> And then he then he could see the screen, and uh, and and it, it worked a lot better after that. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a crazy, a crazy, crazy story. And, and it's another. We actually um, hired uh, another artist. Uh, I think her name was Lynn Young, and she um, uh, did a lot work with John and and did a lot of the characters in the game also. And uh, I remember she. Um, uh, at, at, at after we'd finished Smash TV, she she had proposed that we do this new game, and uh, and it was it was going to be about growing plants, <laughs> and right? Farming and growing plants and stuff, you know. And and we're like, like, oh my god, you know, like, yeah, this is never going to fly. I mean, this this is like people are going to fall asleep. This is a ridiculous concept. This is this is never going anywhere, you know, and. Uh, and then, you know, 20, 30 years later, there's like Farmville. I know, <laughs> the biggest, Harvest Moon. Big, <laughs> the biggest game, you know, Haiti, all this stuff. You know, the biggest games ever, you know, are these farming games, you know, like yeah. she was like 30 years ahead of her time. You know, it's funny how as a, we were like the experts in the field and, you know, what the hell did we know? You know? <laughs> uh, I'd love to ask you, Jean, do you think there's any room for a yeah. new Smash TV game? I mean, I think it could be bought back personally. What do you reckon? Um, that would be, yeah, it would be cool to, to, uh, absolutely, man, you know, to, to just go with that theme, go with the, the classic story there and, yep. uh, um, but just bring a, bring a, uh, a new modern look on it. And, uh, yeah, I don't know, you know, it would be pretty, pretty, pretty crazy. I don't know, you know, maybe we could get, you know, 10 people playing this at oh, once yeah. or something. <laughs> I mean, it's it. like first person or something and you're like, you know, you're competing in this, you know death death match you know the death race the <laughs> whatever it is man but yeah i know it could be uh it, it, obviously it could be an incredible experience you know maybe maybe there's a hundred guys maybe it's a hundred guys on an island you know yeah Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> no, i'd play it definitely <laughs> Oh, oh, GG. Well, look, obviously, you you made a massive stamp. You made some huge games. Uh, is it right you you left midway to work on VR for a little bit? Um, right. Well, this was uh, actually I, I left them, you know, three or four different times. But <laughs> the, the um the uh, I guess the, the the second after Smash TV, I, I left. It was like in '91 or something, and I left to do um basically pioneer a, a 3d texture mapping oh, which wow. i thought was going to be the next thing and uh and then uh um we ended up doing the game uh cruising usa and then cruising yeah World and, cruising Atlantic, and kind of the very early uh 3d uh texture mapping uh games and kind of taking real real live real real footage uh real real world graphics and and uh creating it in 3d and driving around the the, the world and uh that was super fun, mm. super fun uh, project, and uh, um, so that was pretty much the most of the '90s was spent doing those uh, cruising uh, driving games, and uh, um, but then uh, I guess Midway kind of uh, went bust there in the early 2000s, and uh, so I was kind of out of work for a little bit. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so uh, you know, and at the time the arcade was really suffering I yep. mean, kind of like pinball i mean uh, arcade video has not been just uh you know a uh uh you know a joy ride either mm. uh, you know ups and downs and you know great crashes and stuff and so uh um really i was kind of like there wasn't really nobody to hire me so me and a couple of buddies said okay well we'll just start our own arcade game company so you know if you can't get a job go out and make your own <laughs> You know, good on you <laughs> and uh, just uh somehow figure out how to eat but um but yeah and that's how raw thrills got started uh the uh kind of my our, my current uh my current job good on you before we talk about raw thrills cruising usa yeah. was right, huge right. was right. i mean i I'm, i was i don't sound rude but i'm surprised how popular it was i think it's really popular in the u.s maybe not so much in the in europe but it it was even more popular than like Daytona and other Sega races. I mean, what was, I mean, why, why was it so successful? I'm not, you know, I love to hear what, you know, what, you know, what, what, what made it so special really? 
Yeah. Um, and I mean, the whole idea was, and I, I guess, I guess it was kind of, uh, I had played a lot of the, um, uh, Sega, like virtual racing and, uh, um, be, you know, pre cruising games, which, and then there was obviously the Atari uh, classic, uh, hard driving yeah. and race driving, which was the first, uh, really commercial 3d, um, polygon game but it wasn't texture map it was just constant shaded polygons and uh it was just very frustrating um those early kind of 3d driving games um you know you'd like you'd, you'd have to you know there'd be a corner like 200 yards down the road and you'd have to turn like you know a second before you got to the corner <laughs> or, you'd, <laughs> or you'd go off the cliff you know it's like it was just part partly just the um driving dynamics and the and the, it was a very uh um, a lot of uh, lag in the uh, processing of the polygons, yeah. and um, there's a lot to you know. A lot of times you have two or three frame buffers and all kinds of crap going on that um, makes things very laggy and 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 and, and very pro. You have to be really a pro to play those things, and, and so it was like um, I wanted to um, uh, make. Uh, a game. I felt like you know. I want to do a driving game where, like, if you turn left, it actually goes left. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and, if, and if you turn right, you go right. You don't skid in the wall. You don't, you know, you don't flip over. You just, you actually, you know, just like driving down the road. You turn left, you do go left. You know, it's like, is it really that hard? You know, and uh, and so that was cruising was like, hey, and it was trying to get a really snappy um, control on the on the feedback you know really work work through all the lags and and have a very responsive game kind of just just like the defender actually we got it down to like eight milliseconds between mm. you hitting your fire button and seeing your sh- your shot on the screen you know and uh it was kind of like our my a tradition of mine is like let's let's really be responsive to the player and mm. and make the game easier more you know by giving you what you have in real life i mean you turn the steering wheel to the right it turns right it doesn't <laughs> you don't wait a half a second then it goes you know so um that was you know kind of an, an, a driving that anybody could have fun anybody mm-hmm. could enjoy and that was kind of the you know kind of a game for all the rest of the people not for the the top 10 percent of the players right yeah yes yeah. and, and so that was the whole idea of cruising and, and kind of more forgiving more um you know when you head on with something you know, you send them flying into orbit, you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> and you keep going. And it's like, oh, yeah. good. Or you, just, you know, you fly up in the air and you always miraculously land, you know, like, wow, that was cool. You know, like instead of having like, you know, a, a 20 second crash scene where you see, you know, your driver burning up or something, you just miraculously, you know, cartwheel through the air and boom, you're back in the game, you know. And and uh, so that was kind of the the whole um theme there about uh cruising was and just kind of taking the real world out there yeah rather than having some kind of fantasy again just take the real world imagery and and it's like virtual tourism and and you know who doesn't want to drive through you know the grand canyon or paris or tokyo or whatever i want to play it now (laughs) (laughs) Uh, right raw thrills i mean yeah you started your own company raw frills and you even mentioned a bit earlier that the arcade industry was you know going through a bad patch i mean that that took guts to start that company up but fair play i mean how do you reflect on the early days was it quite was it quite stuck quite tough at the start and how do you reflect yeah yeah you know so actually you know it's it's um so yeah it was it was kind of a rough time and uh you know we had a few guys in a very small shop and uh I guess originally we were going to um, go and uh, um, the idea was we were going to go and uh, um, just, uh, you know, we got, well, the arcade's dead, so let's make like a home game or something, you know, mm, mm. and uh, like a console game. And so that actually was, you know, as, as pure as we were, we were like, fuck, we got to make money, you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so... You know, and, and, and we're like, well, but it could be an arcade game, too, if there's any arcade labs. And so we, we spent a couple of years and, and uh, you know, just couldn't, you know, we were trying to be all things to all people, mm. you know, and like, well, it'd be an arcade game, it'd be a home game, it'd be this, it'd be that, you know. No, maybe it'd be mobile, you know, I was like, and finally, after a couple of years, we realized, you know, let's just make a fucking arcade game. You know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> partly, you know, it's amazing when you're down to your last uh 
couple grand, uh, your, your, your mind gets amazingly focused, you know? Yeah. You get amazingly fucking focused. You just have your last couple bucks. What was the first arcade game you made then? Um, the first game uh, uh, for of Rothrails was a, uh, a game called Target Terror. Which uh, it's funny we were working on a driving game actually initially and um, and again we were kind of running out of money and then uh, the whole like 9/11 thing came around. All right. And and so it was like we yeah. thought oh you know this would be a cool you know everybody's getting like so freaked out about the terrorists and this shit and that shit mm. and the whole 9/11 thing and uh, you know it was so crazy and uh, um, the um, the the whole uh uh you know i remember like there was like mayors of small towns like we need to have a you know the military needs to come in here protect me you know and because the terrorists are going to kill me and it was all this paranoia you know just incredible you know um panic and paranoia about terrorism and and we're just thinking okay let's kind of go with this craziness and just hype it up you know 10 10 decibels or 100 decibels and you have like uh, let's let's have them. You know the terrorists are coming. They're going to blow mm-hmm. up the Golden Gate Bridge. They're going to they're going to go to Times Square. You know they're going to you know they're in in the nuclear reactors. They're in the air. You know they're into uh, you know the airports and shit. And just we just thought tried to think of the craziest uh, scenarios um, and just let the bullets fly and the gl- glass break and you know let the blood flow and, <laughs> and so it was. <laughs> It was uh, kind of just a full-on uh, uh, shooter, you know, kind of in the, in the tradition of like uh, um, some of the classic Atari shooters of uh, Area 51 and Max Force, and you know maybe the, some of the old Terminator games and stuff. It was um, um, the idea was to take real, again, real-world uh, backgrounds and take digitized um, fo- footage of the actors. So all the the players and the villains and everybody um, were real people acting, you know, with full motion video uh, placed into this huge 3D world. Mm. And it's amazingly realistic feeling. And and so we could just do crazy, crazy stuff. And, and you get all the emotion of a real actor. I, I think even today, um, with, all, with all the 3D motion capture and everything, there's still like, like this veneer of, of synthetic um kind of phoniness kind yep. of you know you know machinish machine kind of feeling uh, automatons they're not really humans they're kind of mm. really good automatons and uh so that was the uh you know the cool thing about target terror is that we we really captured all that beautiful acting and emotion of a human a real human and, and could you know and we didn't have to like you know program all that shit and everything you just threw a guy in front of a camera and started you know yeah. You know, die, you know, die and make it really cool, man. You know, <laughs> you know, like, you know, and then you just, you're just tapping all that great human, human emotion and acting and everything. It was really cool. Oh, I mean, yeah. Eugene, you, you know better than me, obviously, but yeah. y- your company has been very successful and I don't sound rude, but almost against the odds because the arc, you know, I've seen a lot of arcades around where I sort of live just close. What, why do you think you've been, successful what was your magic ingredients for raw thrills um you know i think partly we uh you know we're really into like a really quality experience Mm. um partly you know we're just super experienced guys you know we have like you know i've been in this business for over 40 years you know and we have many other guys that have been you know 20 or 30 years and, and also we have some really talented just young guys who are you know just like me, they're just like, hey, can you program? Sure, man. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and, uh, you know, young artists and stuff. So you kind of have the mix of the old guys and the new guys. and and uh, But you, you kind of have to, the, the arcade spirit is uh, yeah. the key, you know, where you have to, like, you want to have something super accessible, something that's really fun for everybody, you know, mm-hmm. and, and it's not an expert experience. It's just a, it's a fun experience for everyone. And, and, you know, like in the racing games, you you're really thinking about the human emotional factors and, you know, like you really have to put a, a good rubber band in the game to keep people close, mm-hmm. you know, cause like there's such different skill levels. And, you know, if you ever do it, if you ever work out a driving game, program a driving game, but there's no rubber band to keep the gate, the, the race close, 
the the good player just goes out and you never see him again. You know, yeah. it's like it's no fun. And so you really have to. It's beyond just making a great simulation and a realistic thing. It's it's you need to look at all the human factors of how to give someone a really fun experience and how to how to take people maybe with different levels of skill, put them together, and they can still have a good time. You know, and uh, and with like instant you know, instantly get into the game, understand the game and, and do it, you know, without having to, mm. you know, pay your dues and go to, go to, you know, Fortnite school or something and learn how to play the game. Um, you know, you just get out there and do it in, in 20 or 30 seconds. So that, that's kind of like the arcade spirit of just yep. get out there, very uh, high emotional content, you know, great action and <clears throat> something that everybody can identify with. And, uh, and just have a great time and, 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 you know, really working all those, you know, all that behind the scenes stuff that um, makes for a great experience that makes it seem super simple and fun. But really, there's a lot of, you know, interesting stuff behind the scenes making all that happen. Love it. I mean, I've played some of your arcades, actually. We've got a local um, cinema and they've got like an arcade attached to it. And it's one of the only few around, to be honest, in Croydon where I live. And I've played your Jurassic Park arcade game. It's absolutely incredible. I've also played Space Invaders Frenzy. I mean, you've got some some big names as well. You've got, uh, you know, some big type Alien games, Halo games, you know, some big IPs. But I have to say, I do enjoy your games a lot. I mean, how did you secure such sort of big names and stuff? Is that quite a big job or tough job or yeah it is um yeah it, it just really years and years of work um mm. the first uh big license we got was fast and furious mm. um back in the early 2000s and uh um you know that was uh you know every now and then something like lands in your lap um where you're um looking for a license for a game or something and uh and uh, i remember a buddy of mine uh my buddy Joe called me up and go, Hey, you know, you're doing a driving game. I, I can, you know, I can get you fast and furious. I'm like, what? Nice. Nice. <laughs> like, and, it, and it was crazy because I was like working on this game, this driving game that was, it was called hot cars at the time. I was like, hot cars, man. That's cool. You know? Yeah. And, uh, and I don't, you know, people go, well, what are you doing? You know, at Roth Hill, it's like, what the fuck are you doing over there? I'm like, Oh, we're making this really cool, like street gazing game. You know, it's like, it's called hot cars. You know, and they go, really? Is that like Fast and Furious? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you know, and then my buddy calls me up and says, "Hey, I get Fast and Furious." I'm like, "Hell yeah!" Yeah, you'd be you silly know? not and, to. <laughs> and so, um, but it was like, uh, so sometimes it's just like a stroke of fortune. But then you you kind of you you get your track record together, and yeah. you know, you 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 do some you know great work, great quality, you know, and uh, and then uh, you know every now and then they'll come to you and and uh, I remember actually Jurassic Park was one of those uh, really fortunate events where, um, you know, we had kind of, uh, uh, we were just looking for a new project and uh, a uh, actually a, an agent representing uh, Universal, a uh, licensing agent, you know, called us up and, and said, uh, you know, wanted to come by and pitch some of their, their titles, you know, and, uh, um, you know, a lot of times they're kind of pitching their back catalog and, yeah. You know, some of the stuff maybe, uh, you know, maybe seen at better times, you know, and, but, uh, you know, you listen to them and maybe there's some gems there. And, uh, mm. and this was in about, I think, 2011, before there was any talk of a sequel uh. to Jurassic Park or anything. And, uh, and, you know, he's like, yeah, how about Jurassic Park, you know, and, and we're like, like, hmm, you know, like, isn't that, wasn't that like 20 years ago? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Yeah. And then, but you know, the more we thought about it, we go, wow, you know, that's, that's such an evergreen classic and like kids really love, uh, dinosaurs, you know, it's, yeah. it's just, it's a never ending fascination with dinosaurs and, and it was just such a classic game and such a great, um, title. And actually Sega did an original Jurassic Park, uh, game that was very successful. And, uh, but you know, it'd been like 20 years and, and technology had, had gone, you know, unbelievable. And, and we just go, wow, we could just really make, go back and make a really incredible Jurassic Park, mm. uh, uh, you know, rail, rail shooter game. And, uh, and, uh, you know, so that was kind of the, uh, the, uh, the emphasis of that, you know, so it's a lot of times you're just being open. I find like, you know, like a big part of being a game designer and, and being, uh, in the industry, it's like, you realize like, you're not the font of, you're not the font of infinite wisdom, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, 
you have to keep your eyes and ears open all the time and listen to your players. And when they tell you your game sucks, you know, if one guy tells you your game sucks, you know, maybe he's wrong. When like the 10th guy tells you your game sucks, <laughs> your game sucks, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, and so you got to be open and like, Hey, how, you know, what's an idea? What's a great idea? Tell me a great idea for this game, you know? And, and uh, actually, you know, Space Invaders, you mentioned Space Invaders. That was, yeah. uh, so we, you know, I love that IP. I love the license. I love the, I love the game. And we're, um, I actually came up with this idea, like, hey, let's make, because like the arcade is all about big today, you know, where the things yes. are bigger and bigger and bigger. And like, you know, our Halo game is like fucking, you know, three stories high. And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just like a spaceship landed in the arcade. Anyway, so we're like, I'm going like, well, how do I, you know, space and I love space and there's like, what do we, you know, how can we make it cool? You know, like, and I'm thinking like these big led billboard things i'm going holy shit yeah we'll have them we'll, we'll get like a billboard screen you know and make the thing 10 feet high you know like and people are gonna love it you know it's like we'll have a 10 foot high space invaders you know <laughs> and uh you know like with the bright leds and so you know we, we we mocked one up and it was just so fucking cool because the the bright you don't realize like standard tvs really aren't that bright mm. and and the viewing angle is really kind of limited and and uh, you put an, a full blown, you know, one LED, one RGB LED for every pixel on on Space Invaders, and the, you crank that thing up, and it's just like, wow! You know, it's like <laughs> you're just brain, you know. I, I think you know we're kind of, I know like crows like shiny objects, you know, and I think he, human beings like shiny objects too, mm-hmm. you know. And like, and you turn those LEDs up, and you're just like, ah! You know, like you're a zombie, man. You just you can't you can't stop looking at it, and uh, and so. Um, you know, so we're working with it, and like, how do we uh, do Space Invaders? So we, you know, start out with a classic game, and and uh, you know, I mean, a great game, a wonderful game, but you know, we're kind of in the modern arcade. You know, things have kind of sped up, and people want shit to happen like in two minutes. You know, and and they want more, really more action. As mm. as as incredible as Space Invaders was in in the seventies, you know, today people are just, you know, it's just like you watch a, a commercial from the nineteen sixties, and it's just like they had like minute long commercials you know yeah. and it's like the it's just like it took forever like you know tell me the name of the product you know what the fuck you know like i've, I've been watching this commercial for 40 seconds i should yeah. have heard the product name 20 times by now you're like what the hell is this and and so it's like uh, the same thing where like an, a 20 year old 30 year old basically a 40 year old game the pace of action is really you know not not as uh just not as challenging as it was in that era. And so we go, man, we have to like, how do we, you know, crank this thing up? How do we get the action flowing here? And uh, actually my partner at, um, at Raw Thrills here, um, Andy Eloff, I don't know, he had, he had a bad dream or something or a nightmare, but he, he, uh, he, you know, he was playing down there one day and, and it was next to our Jurassic Park game. And, you know, and he's, we had some really bad versions of Space Invaders that we were doing, and it was just like so frustrating. And then, you know, I guess he looks over at the Jurassic Park controller, which is mm. kind of like a machine gun, and uh, and just like, dude, <laughs> like let's put that <laughs> on Space Invaders, you know, like. Yeah. And so we put those Jurassic Park guns on Space Invaders, and it was like, it was like a, you know, revelation. You know, it was just like, oh my god, this is incredibly fun, you know. It's just like it was instantly maybe the fun one of the most fun games ever, you know. Yeah. And uh, just that one thing, and then of course then we had to make the invaders tougher, you know, because you're machine gunning them. So then it was like, okay, we'll have multiple grids of space invaders coming down on you at the same time, <laughs> you know, I'm like, you know, and then we'll have like these super these red ones that are just incredibly vicious coming down, and it's just like, and it becomes like this super intense, this kind of like Robotron space invaders, you know, and. Uh, and it was just all of a sudden that game was just like so much fun. And, and I guess that was one of the I think there's only been a couple times in my life where a game was fun in like 10 seconds. And one of those one time was when I first put Robotron up on the screen mm. and it was just like, oh, my God, you know, this is just so fun, you know, blowing these guys up. And they're all coming at me. And like I remember the the first day I, I you know, I was like, oh, I'll try 10 of them. And then I, you know, said, OK, let's do 20. And then like <laughs> it was like, let's do 100, you know, like. And there's like these hundred guys converging and we go, fuck, this is a great game, you know, and, and that Space Invaders had that same feeling, you know, when we put those, 
Jurassic Park guns on Space Invader and just like, oh, because that's what you want when you play Space mm-hmm. Invaders. You don't want you don't want to be a pea shooter. You want a, a a real weapon, you know, an automatic weapon, you know, to, to deal with these guys, you know. And Great. It was, like, it was just like, what does the player really want? What's the player's <laughs> fantasy? You know, give the player what his fantasy is, you know. And uh, so that was that was kind of the the whole Space Invaders thing, which is really a fun fun game. And you know, they have those in in Tokyo at the at the Tato headquarters and. It's pretty fun. Um, yeah. Uh, but, you know, the, uh, yeah, so, and we did the giant Pac-Man too, which was a, another kind of fun, fun game in that, that format. My um, eight-year-old son, who hasn't really heard of Space Invaders before, he loved it. He, you know, the, uh, the Space Invaders game, I thought it was brilliant, by the way. Just a nice take on the classic. Um, Eugene, I've got a really tough question now. Out, okay. of all the, out of all the games you've worked on, which one are you most proud of? Because you worked on some real classics. It's a tough question, I'm sure. Yeah, well, you know, I really have to say Robotron. Mm. You know, I really have to say Robotron because that was there was that there was just some magic there and uh, um, getting those. I remember uh, making that early prototype. I think it was starting with a Stargate cabinet, and, and I took a couple of Atari twenty six hundred controllers, joysticks, yeah, and and screwed them onto a piece of plywood, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and then wired them up and put them in there, and just you know that first day. I mean, it might have been the third day I was working on the game, and you know I got the grunts on the screen, and I put you in the metal, and I got the firing going, and yeah. I'm just like, holy shit, this is <laughs> magic, you know, this is fucking magic, and and so then I, I spent the rest of the six months just, you know, putting all the cool characters and just all the all the fluff and the, you know, added just the rich veneer of the game threw that in there but it's like i had the broth i had like the mm. best fucking chicken broth ever you know <laughs> and i just you know i knew i was i was i could have sold that you know yeah. but I, I i knew but you know i threw some vegetables in there and some chunks of meat and this that and the other and you know this is going to be a great great game good answer um can you reveal any exciting projects or arcades you're working on or is it all quite pretty hush hush at the moment um you know we actually we're, we're working on um kind of exciting we, we decided to get a little involved in the vr thing ah and uh the uh and i, I guess you know you, i think the um um you know i think uh uh you know something i've always been fascinated with and and uh it's amazing I, you know i've done research on vr and it's actually it was actually originally demonstrated in like 1968 wow um and so it's been around forever and it's and it, um and it always kind of gets overhyped. And then, you you know, I remember in the early 90s, uh, there was kind of a big VR craze. Yep. And uh, and there was some early VR games out and this one, Virtuality. I don't know if you remember that one. Yes, yes. And uh, it was pretty amazing. But, you know, like you, you played for, it was pretty pixelated and and laggy and stuff. And, and it was it was incredible to be in this in this totally synthetic world, you know. But it was just so laggy and, you know, and just the thing, you know, after a couple of minutes, you know, you just have a splitting headache, you know, and you're ready to barf. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and it's like, you know, and you, and it's like, and you get off of it and people would go, you know, you're like turning blue and people would go like, well, how was it? And you go, oh, that was fucking amazing. You try it. You know, it's like, <laughs> <that's> like <laughs> and then, but you'd never go back, you know? Yeah. 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 And, uh, and, uh, but, uh, I think finally, you know, the technology is really, you know, after endless hype and endless, uh, you know, imperfect implementations, uh, we are getting in with the resolution and stuff. We're we're on the verge of some really great uh, VR experiences that um, is really going to add, you know, this whole new dimension into into uh, uh, video gaming. And uh, so we're working on on a new title there. Um, Actually, it's going to be. coming out uh hopefully in a few months if we ever get over this uh the virus oh, yeah. thing here yeah um and uh it's it's called uh um it's a, it's going to be a uh uh kong king kong game wow it's called uh um kong king kong of skull island that does sound and, exciting uh, and uh, it's just an incredible experience for for vr so um we had just an amazing team doing that so and it's a motion game also so we have motion and uh both motion and vr at the same time um, i'm excited so that's that we're working on that and uh and you know we're, do, we're doing you know 
a lot, you know, some new drivers and, uh, um, you know, we, I guess we just, just came out with a, a really, really fantastic motorcycle game called uh, super bikes three, mm. which is just getting out there. And it's just uh, a phenomenal, uh, you know, motorcycle simulator that, uh, we're very proud of. And, uh, um, so, you know, and we're working on some, some other stuff too, but, uh, you know, it's always, it's always fun. It's always, uh, there's always a new challenge, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's weird. Like you're in a business where your product line goes obsolete every couple of years, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 you know, in some ways you go, man, that really sucks. You know, it's like, <laughs> I mean, that's like, who would want to work in a business like that? You know, like, you know, like I, you know. I would have, you know, I'm, I'm going to sell this joystick for 40 years. You know, it's the best <laughs> joystick ever. But, um, but you know, so it does suck because you're you're always like, what the fuck are we, you know, how am I going to pay people next week, you know? But um, the cool thing about it is that you have to keep reinventing yourself mm-hmm. and, and coming up with new ideas and and everything's new every couple of years. So it, you never get, you know, you know, not not you know, making the same, uh, you know, shock absorber for your entire career. <laughs> you know, you're. <laughs> You know, you're, uh, you're, you know, you're, you're constantly, you're forced to make cool new things all the time. I could so on you. It, it, it's super, uh, you know, it's, it, it keeps you, it keeps you going. It keeps you your toes. Yeah. It, uh, you know, um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy. And then and there's, there's some great new kids coming along that, uh, it's so fun to work with, you know, and, uh, you know, now, now instead of, you know, at one point I was the young, you know, ingenue. <laughs> you know, boy genius. And now I'm, you know, getting, uh, you know, getting on a little bit and, uh, it's great working with like some of the new talent out there. It's, uh, it's amazing, amazing, great young kids coming into the industry. So oh, good stuff. That's, that's very, very thrilling for me. Actually, I've always wanted to know Eugene with, with arcades, obviously they've got a sh- relatively short shelf life. What, what do you do with the old arcades? Are they re- refurbished or thrown away or? Ah, uh, the old games. Well, my games, of course, they always keep those. Of know? course, <laughs> <laughs> of course. They of course. never, they, ne- they never wear out, man. They never, <laughs> they never. Uh, I mean, you know, they, uh, they're, you know, they kind of have a. They go from, you know, the A location to the B yeah. location to the C location. Sometimes they'll end up, uh, you know, in in uh, other countries and, yeah. you know, and uh, you know, and then eventually they end up in somebody's basement or, I guess, in a dumpster. You know? <laughs> Like, Fair enough, <laughs> but not not raw thrills. Never raw thrills. No, of course, no. The, no these are <laughs> these are priceless. These are, uh, you know, they are, yeah. you know, masterpieces. You couldn't, of course. couldn't throw couldn't throw one of those in a dumpster. <laughs> <laughs> I've got two or three really quick fire last minute questions, uh, Eugene. But I know you're a busy man. It's been a brilliant, really fascinating interview. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I think this is a tough question actually, because uh, you've we worked on quite devilish games actually so if you could step inside any of the games you've worked on and live there for a day which game would you choose um that's a tough call you know um yeah. well definitely not the driving games because they get run over you know so <laughs> <laughs> um you know i, I mean you know that's interesting I, I probably the uh you know maybe some of the most interesting world would be uh Either uh, Smash TV or, or the game uh, Narc. I don't know if you remember the game Narc. I know Narc, um, yeah. And uh, where you were kind of in the the uh, back in the uh, drug wars and uh, that whole uh, all the interesting cast of characters there in the Narc world. So um, probably something like that, you know, um, you know more, you know, something with a more interesting story and in complex uh, world, you know, to hang out yeah. in and and meet some of the interesting. Uh, shady characters <laughs> <laughs> there will be some shady characters that's for sure <laughs> right penultimate question did you ever start work on any games uh, that were never released any, uh, and and maybe looking back you 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 know quite sad about that there's any games you think actually could have been quite successful but were never released for any reason ah uh, you know there's there's uh, i get a whole i have file cabinets full of those <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> Um, you know, just it, it, it's uh, that's the the one frustration of, of working in the, in the as a game designer in the yeah. game business is, is that uh, ideas are cheap. You know, you can uh, I mean, me and you could we, we had a couple of pints and you know and and uh, got a notebook out. We could we could probably you know create twenty or thirty pretty interesting uh, game <laughs> concepts. You know, at least for that evening. Maybe the next day they they may not stand the test of time, but. 
there's just like an infinity of ideas and there's so many cool things that you could do uh in the genre and and uh um and so it's so it's always so frustrating because you know you're you're working on a game and it takes maybe you know often it's multiple years to really craft a game i think mm. jurassic park i think we spent like four years on the game and uh so it's it's like your imagination runs so much quicker than the reality of of actually mm. implementing and and crafting a game, and uh, so yeah, there's just uh, um, uh, yeah a lot of concepts. I remember uh, I was I, I, one thing I've always wanted to do and never been able to do it is uh, kind of a firefighting game, you know, where you're like in a building that's burning down, you know, and you're you know fighting yeah. the fire with the you know you have the fire hose and you're you know trying to you know, duck on, duck down and not breathe the smoke and trying to work your way up through the fire to rescue someone. Mm. And, uh, you know, just, and just feel that, you know, kind of in, in first person, you know, and, um, that sounds amazing. you know, and that would be a really cool game, you know, that, uh, you know, haven't been able to, to, uh, to, to get, you know, you, you need, you need, you'd probably, you know, a hundred lifetimes to do all the cool games out there, man. It's mm. like, uh, you know, I, I, I'd, uh, I, I always loved. Uh, I remember one time I wanted to make the uh, like a, a sailboat, uh, virtual sailboat racing game. <laughs> and, uh, wow! You know, and uh, have uh, you know water come splashing up in your face. <laughs> Shit. Oh, that would be amazing. <laughs> I guess you'd have to have like buckets of water coming <laughs> on you at the right. <laughs> you know, you make the you make the wrong turn, you capsize. You know, there's a bucket of water comes down on you from. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you'd have to have some sort of, uh, you know, waterproof area that you would, uh, oh. <laughs> you know, kind of a wet zone. Um, but, uh, yeah. And, 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 uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, try to, you know, try to really, um, the cool thing about the arcade, you know, is trying to work with more and more your senses, you know, mm. not only the, you know, your sight, your hearing, your, you know, vibration, your, um, you know, maybe, you know, squirting water on you, you know, doing, you know, trying to, try to involve you, uh, you know, every, every part of your body in the game. Mm, I think, and, yeah, that's how you got to stay above the consoles and stuff, isn't it? Something a little bit different. Fair play to you. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly. It's trying to, you know, you're really getting in the, rather than, I mean, that's the beauty of the arcade is that you have a blank slate, you know, you don't, it's not like, okay, here's your controller. Here you go. You're sitting on your couch, you know, like um, with the with the arcade is like, yeah, I can sit you in a, you know, a, a booth with, you know, 20 speakers directed at you. And mm. and I can, you know, kind of control the lighting and I can give you a special like we did this Walking Dead game and you have like this special crossbow controller and, and you're shooting zombies with a crossbow and you have to, you know, pull back the, the string and, you know, and uh, shoot the zombies with your, you know, bow and arrow and. You know, you can really involve a lot. You think more physical rather than just being yep. a, uh, um, you know, just a simulation of a simulation. Eugene, you've been a real gentleman today. I've, I've absolutely generally found this interview so interesting. I know our listeners are going to love it. So I really appreciate your time. Um, I've got one final question. Bit, okay. of a, bit, bit one silly question. But if you could share a few drinks with any video game character, who would you choose and why? Ah. Uh-huh. You know that that is a uh, that's a tough one, but yeah, I, I guess you'd have to. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm thinking like the iconic. Uh, you know, you'd have to go with Mario and uh, the plumber. You know. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh yes. <laughs> you know, you'd have to like get a dude like, you know, what's up, man? Like, where's your, uh, you know, where's your hundred million dollar house, man? <laughs> let's, let's go have some fun, man. He so, sees some things, yeah. yeah. You probably have the, you know, he's probably collecting, you know, gold plated, uh, you know, adjustable wrenches and shit, you know, <laughs> and, uh, it is, it is, it is bad, you know, and, uh, yeah. but, uh, you know, that was a great, I, I guess, you know, from a, uh, I guess the, the other thing, maybe this, this dates me, you know, was, uh, you know, from back in the day, uh, I remember like Laura Croft was the yeah. sex symbol of, oh, of, yeah. uh, of uh, the original, you know, fem- femme fatale of, uh, of video gamers and uh you know i think they they even did a movie didn't they uh yes i think there's been a few a few tomb raider, tomb raider films yeah there, so. yeah yeah the tomb raider thing and uh so that, there's always that i remember the i remember when that came out and I, I remember um this friend of mine he would play it and all he did was just make her like fall off a cliff and watch the the, the, <laughs> the fall and the kind of the ragdoll effect it was just yeah. like 
of an in, it was just like there was so much it was just it was just incredibly interesting just killing her off you know multiple <laughs> hundreds of times in a row we just watching the body roll around and and scream and stuff and it was just strange uh it's weird how how you know when you get in these sandbox games you know people uh they'll do some really weird stuff you know uh <laughs> yep you know like uh, i guess you know obviously the uh the um you know a lot of the uh the crime games you know and uh yeah you know the ours you know obviously interesting uh infinitely interesting too grand theft auto you know just you know being in that world you know would be kind of interesting <laughs> Oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> oh, Eugene, look, really appreciate the chat today. It's been such an honor. Um, some brilliant and really funny stories. So thank you so much for your time. Hey, thank you, Adrian. And uh, great. Good luck with the, your uh, journalism and uh, podcasting and everything, man. It's, uh, oh, it's it. such a pleasure talking with you. You're uh, kind of a legend in your own uh, in your own <laughs> mind. No, <laughs> no, no, yeah, basically. No, 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 but it's such a pleasure. What a what, uh, I could talk to you for a few days, you know, and we still, have, we still have weeks more to say. Thanks for listening to today's podcast. We really hope you enjoyed it. If you want to get in touch regarding this week's episode or anything else, you can tweet us at Arcade Attack UK, at Keith Barlow 82 and at Arcade underscore Adriano. We're also 